Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this rules workshop. I am Amelia Boyd, and I am the program manager for the commission and the organizer for this webinar. This meeting is being recorded and will be made available sometime probably tomorrow. The documents which we discussed here today are available in the handout section and on our website, which is wmc.wa.gov. All attendees are muted. Panelists may unmute themselves and share their webcam. Attendees, if you have a question, please use the raise your hand function or use the question section. We will get to your questions as quickly as possible. I will be in the roll call of panelists and staff. When I call your name, please introduce yourself. So first on my list is Dr. Lewis. Okay, moving on, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is Heather Carter. Um, I'm an Assistant Attorney General Legal Advisor to the Commission. And then Melanie? I'm Melanie DeLeon, the Executive Director for the Commission. And then Micah? Micah Matthews, Deputy Executive Director of the Commission. Mr. Farrell? Michael Farrell, Policy Development Manager for the Commission. Dr. Small? Hi, this is Dr. Robert Small. I'm a commissioner and my background is in psychiatry. And Dr. Yu? Um, I am uh, a public member on the medical board. And then Dr. Lewis, can you introduce yourself as well? Hello, I'm Charlotte. I'm a pediatrician and I'm a commissioner. Thank you. And then Ms. Schimmels, go ahead and introduce yourself and then you can read the script. Um, good afternoon. My name is Teresa Schimmels. I'm a physician assistant member of the commission from Eastern Washington. I will be the presiding officer for this rules workshop. Today is Wednesday, May 12th, year 2021, and it is 6.30, oh, excuse me, 5.34 p.m. This meeting is being held via the GoToWebinar platform. The rule being discussed today is regarding our proposed clinical support program. The pre-proposal pre rules package was filed with the Washington State Register as number 18-06-007 on February 22, 2018. We will now discuss the comment from the Washington State Medical Association. So the comment was in the packet. It's also on the screen. I will attempt to get our draft language up here as well. If there's anything that you would like to talk about with this comment, here it is. Wrong one. <laughs> okay. Okay, so <clears throat> as far as this first part of the letter where it talks about the confidentiality, um, all, all of our complaints, whether they're closed BT, whether they are closed after investigation, they are all subject to public disclosure. So we can't put anything in a whack that would change that. So. <clears throat> right. I don't know how to address this issue because everything we do is open to public scrutiny. Unless it's mm -hmm. specifically exempt under the Public Records Act, and how that would be a legislative issue and not something that we could put in rules, as I understand it. Correct. So, um, you know, we we had discussed this in the earlier workshops and um, I believe we, we came to the conclusion that we didn't have to post the uh, any of this on the provider search site where the um, STIDs and uh, orders get posted but if there is an inquiry then the information would have to be disclosed. Mike am I recalling that correctly? Yes. 
<clears throat> and to be honest, I don't believe that places the respondent in any worse yeah, situation. I, I think, than you know, a certain public transparency is very important. <clears throat> And I, I think that the commission is not in the position to make the rule or or, or change the law that uh, that govern the uh, public records, uh, what you call the Public Records Act. The law says, you know, when the patient asks for information, they are entitled to get the records. Right. 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 So putting, I mean, having this clinical support program and having the, the respondent gets a complaint, those complaints, whether we have this rule or not, are always open to, uh, to public scrutiny. So this clinical support rule doesn't place them in any more exposure to the public disclosure than if we didn't have the rule. And it, we're, what we're saying is that the that the the support plan that the respondent has with the board is not put on the credential uh, provider lookup, but it would be open to public disclosure should someone request it. Right, just like every other complaint, right. And then their next comment is concerning the alleged voluntary nature of the program. And so they talk about, um, I mean, I think that has been an issue in the past when we've talked about this particular rule that it is voluntary. And so they want us to change it to where it expressly reflects that we intend to create a voluntary program. Trying to see. I know at one time we did have that language in here, but we've changed it a lot over the last six years we've been working on this, so. Well, I'm oh, I'm concerned about the uh, the nature if it changes to totally uh, voluntary because based on the criteria we set, what kind of uh, uh, issues that could be resolved under this clinical support, uh, clinical uh, support program. Some of them are, you know, it just, it will not happen, but it didn't, it will not happen in the future. It doesn't mean it's not serious enough that concerns uh, the commission and the patient who file complaint. So I don't think that that should be go totally voluntary. So, uh, Amelia, if you can scroll back up a little to, <clears throat> I think, sub four, sub C. Um, so it says the physician agrees to participate. So to me, that essentially says it's voluntary. Uh, um, we don't necessarily address what happens if the physician doesn't agree to participate. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the, the one of the criteria is the physician agrees to participate. So there's nothing in that that says to me that the way this is currently written, that we could uh, force a physician to participate who's not agreeing to participate. So uh, again, in, in my mind, that says voluntary. Any thoughts, Mike? Uh, yeah, I wonder if we could make a, a clear statement. I would put it in number two, uh, right near the beginning, when we're defining, and I'm recommending that we remove that second sentence. Let um, me pull up your recommended. Um, okay. Because 
It is different. Let me pull that up. Uh, I, I think it's a fair point that we should make it very clear that it's voluntary. And I think there's a way to do that, putting it in number two. So, well, and this gets I'll, into I'll another issue as, as you're looking. Okay, um, this gets into another issue. I think one of the bigger issues, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, is to try to define the universe of cases that would apply because we just we haven't well, done that. Um, I have uh, I, I have a huge issue with that actually. <laughs> Okay, do you want to dive right in then now? All right, so, uh, so as you will no doubt recall, when we first started this, Amelia said it was six years ago, <laughs> um, I had proposed <clears throat> for number one that we uh, add something to the effect of um, uh, you know, practice deficiencies that do not rise to the level of the UDA violation and, and I think, Mike, you had some concerns about that particular language. So it was in and then it was taken out. But the, the way this reads right now, I cannot tell the difference between what would go into this program and what would be uh, eligible for a STID. So I think we haven't made that demarcation yet. And I think we need to do that in item number one. <clears throat> so whether it's doesn't rise to the level of you know UDA violation or uh, <clears throat> doesn't pose an immediate uh, risk to patient safety or some other language. We need to, even though there's always going to be an element of judgment, there needs to be some demarcation between what is clinical support and what's a STID. And I don't think that we have that in here yet. Well, I, I would agree with uh, uh, Dr. Small. I have written, uh, submitted my comments to the commission when we went through this process. I saw, I also uh, expressed my concerns at our workshop before on this particular, uh, uh, you know, the uh, WAC proposal, and to remove the language, mm -hmm. original language that says doesn't the, this program only apply to uh, the. Uh, you know, the deficiency that does not rise the level of UDA, I think that really draw a line, what would be all within this clinical support program and which are or uh, were not applied for. That also make it easy for uniformed, uh, you know, the uh, actions to be taken. Otherwise, it would be at the discretion of the panels or commissioner, uh, reviewing commissioners. So I'm afraid that that would have created non-uniform standards. And also the original purpose for this proposal, this WAC, is that there are certain uh, deficiency that cannot be, the commission cannot take action under the UDA or under the uh, sanction guideline. That's why we created this in the first place. So I strongly urge the uh, commission to really think about what Dr. Small has said and, and also I s support and, and I had concerns about this. And that in that case, then voluntarily would be very easily to help us to draw the line when we consider whether voluntarily or shouldn't be voluntarily because we talk about you will not have a certain condition, you will not pose uh, you know, to risk to patient, but that got to be have a, a very clear guideline to us for us for commissioners. Okay, I I, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Small and Dr. Yu. There has to be. When I was looking at this and preparing for the meeting, I realized there's just no clear demarcation between what conduct is appropriate for a stid and what conduct is appropriate for a clinical support plan. Uh, and, and my concern, concern that I have is that we would take cases that would normally merit SPIDs and reporting, important reporting, and use clinical support plans to easily dispose of them. And that's what I don't want to happen. So I, in, in looking at this and making these edits, I tried to make that demarcation and also talking with Cairo to see how they apply this. And what I did was I thought if we're going to do, if the commission is going to monitor a physician 
monitoring should be reported. Other states should know that we're monitoring a physician. It shouldn't be a, a secret deal. So I took out monitoring, I took out education and training. Those are the types of things that normally you have in STIDs, having a physician go take a class, write a paper, uh, appear before you. And I, I narrowed it down. I tried to really narrow it down to cases in which a practice change is needed and it can be implemented quickly. So no monitoring, no supervising, no courses, nothing for us to do, just have the physician make a slight change in his or her practice. And that would be the clinical support plan. So that's what I try to do there, number one and number two. So, so, so Mike, so Mike, go ahead, Mike, Mike. So, Mike, as I read this, what what this does is effectively creates a a letter of guidance or concern. Is that is that what it turns it into? Uh, it's we, similar. We, we identify I didn't think something of it that we don't. Way. We identify something we have concerns with, and we say you can fix this by doing A, B, and C. Here you go. Yeah. Okay. Except it, it's different than a letter of concern, Micah, in, in that the respondent has to agree. It's got to agree to sign off on this. So, so Micah, sign off I'm, on what? The commission's opinion that that's what would fix it? Yes. Because at this point, you don't, you don't have education, training, or monitoring or anything else. It's just right. the items we think will fix the practice. Yeah, and this will be in a publicly disclosable document that's not reported. It's so, just so an Michael, idea to try to make a dividing line. That's all. So, Michael, I try to understand what you just said. So, are, are you agree of that we should have a language that says does not rise to the level of UDA sanction? We would apply to this clinical support program. Is that, am I getting right for what you just said? I, I didn't address that specific issue, Dr. Yu, but you, you could put in language that, um, that says something like that. I saw language in, in one of the rules that said uh, to address a deficiency that if it continues could rise to the level of, of unprofessional conduct or could, could result in patient harm. Something where we don't say flat out it does not, but we say that it could if the conduct, if the condition or deficiency continues. That's what I would recommend. Okay, but, but sometimes, you know, we do not know or guarantee but whether this would not continue or not, because sometimes, you know, when we do say repeated, you know, the, uh, the uh, offending, you know the you know the practice doesn't met you know very optimal medicine and care. So how do we make sure that you know we definitely know that it not occur? You mean after they complete the plan or before? No, well, we're at the time when you make a decision, you say this is a what program you're gonna get. We recommend you do go to the the uh, you make a decision. Whether sanction or not sanction, use this, you know, support clinical support program. But your criteria is that we're gonna say that we we think that this action will not occur, you know, or again, or will not continue. But how we make sure that it will not continue? So, so <laughs> I would no say, and I, I think that's I'm gonna interrupt for a second. I would say that that would be. I mean, the choice then is they either do this or. It would be, I would, are, are we going to have some mechanism where we'd go back to the RCM and be reevaluated to see if it rises to the level of a UDA and we end up with a stud? I see. I, Is that where this I would go, way, Mike? I, I think the way this would play out is uh, you'd be sitting uh, during case reviews and you, would, let's say during case reviews tomorrow, you'd be presenting a case and you'd be saying, I recommend uh, a, this is appropriate for the clinical support program. And your panel would decide, is this worthy of a stipulation, informal disposition, a statement of charges, or a clinical support or closure? And you'd make a judgment call at that time. 
And whenever you make that judgment call, you don't know how it's going to play out. You just don't have certainty. There's a there's amount of right. trust and judgment that you're going to exercise. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And there are oftentimes we do see, you know, where a physician or a physician assistant does need maybe just a little education or uh, a skills workshop or something that they can hone their skills um, that will increase their uh, safety towards practice and decrease our, the public risk. Does that help to line that out a little bit more clearly for you, Dr. Yu? Yeah, I, I think I can do that. I, 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 you know, I think the bottom line is this is a, a volunteer, voluntary nature some kind of bother me because if we have a concerns on patient safety, and even though we, we, we're saying this may not happen again, that's because we don't want to happen again because we have a concern that may, you know, harm or, or you know, to the patient. So then we say we want you to do it voluntarily. If you don't do it, fine. If you do it, fine. Well, so, I, uh, I think there's some logic. confusion there. Uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah I, I think there's, <laughs> yeah, saying, saying it's voluntary means the physician has a choice whether to sign the document or not. Once they sign the document, it's not voluntary. They have to follow through. Right, but they can voluntarily not sign it, right? Even though, we have, even though we have a concerns about this could be, you know, a slip, slippery slope. Every document we ask them to sign is voluntary. They don't have to sign a STID. They don't have to sign an agreed order. They're turned down all the time. This is just another document that they have a choice whether to resolve the complaint in this way. Every document is voluntary. Yeah, you know, this is not sure. going to be 100% foolproof, and there, you know, there will be physicians who decline to sign, um, but at least in offering the program, we've let them know that we have concerns about A, B, C, and D, rather than not having communicated anything about it. But um, you know, there, there's just no way to make this 100% airtight. Um, I, I, do, I, I do have to come back to, I, I do think the, you know, the first item number one still needs to specify something to make a distinction uh, between clinical support and STIDs. As I read this, practice deficiencies means a STID to me. So uh, right off the bat, so if I'm reading this, I want to know right away what's the difference between this and a, something that's potentially subject to a STID. So, you know, and we, we've tossed around, you know, a couple different options. I'm not... Uh, glued to any particular option. I just think we need to put something in there. I think the difference is a STIT, you will not report being reported. But there's clinical support program. But under STIT, you will be reported. It's the other way around. And then under this program, you will not be reported. So there's a choice for them to whether you want to go to STIT or you want to <laughs> go to the clinical support but, i guess but bob what you're saying i think is that it um it there's something about what we're focused on it's not so much our response but it's it's the actual behavior or whatever that leads to this that we have to have sort of the differentiation between what qualifies for clinical support and what qualifies for something else that's more disciplinary and nature right 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 yes so again yeah i come back to uh, come back to i mean again my preference you know from the beginning was you know practice deficiencies that don't rise to the level of uda violation but i uh i, I can't remember mike what the issues were with that language well um and i don't oppose that language um, I'm looking at it right now on, on an old draft. Uh, the The issue was, if you say right up front, it does not rise to the level of a UDA violation, then you're telling the physician, you don't need to sign this. That, okay. that 
a physician who understands the process or has an attorney who understands the process is going to think, why sign it if you're saying right up front there's no there's no unprofessional conduct. Okay, that, that, that's a good memory refresher. But also, but, um, like, if you were to say, what we're saying is, if this behavior continues, then it could be something, right? right? So if we say, it doesn't rise to the level of uh, um, UDA, what did you call it? UDA violation. UDA violation, But then yeah. couldn't someone come back and argue, well, I thought you said that this didn't rise to a UDA, and now, sub let's say the behavior continues, and we do take disciplinary action, you just wouldn't want that to like come back and bite you, right? Because we actually said, oh, well, it wasn't really that bad. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so I remember, um, you know, Alden's conceptualization of it, for those of us that were in the early workshops, was that the, the physician is standing on the cliff but hasn't gone over the cliff yet, but is at risk of doing so. So is there yeah. another way besides like linking it to a UDA violation yeah. that we could make that differentiate? Yeah, what was the other language that you floated a few minutes ago, Mike? Uh, the, to address a, a practice deficiency that may not constitute unprofessional conduct, but if continued, That, that may not rise to the level of uh, a violation of, of the UDA, but if continued, could result in a violation or or patient a risk of patient harm or something along those lines. What do you I think like of that, that. Yeah. <clears throat> do we have a? Oh, so we have a you, you still so there's a still language, and if you if uh, it may rise to the level, it's not a uh, rise to the level. It does not rise to the level of a uh, UDA sanction. Does, do we have a specific definition of deficiency? Is there a legal no. definition? And something that can be resolved very quickly. I, I, I have a, I, I do, I guess I have of concern using the word deficiency if we don't have a definition for it. Yeah, I was wondering about maybe saying something like um, using similar language, but but not using the word deficiency and saying something like um, there's a concern within the practice that if it continues could potentially lead to something like that, or is that too vague? I think that I actually like that better. We want to say practice concern instead of practice deficiency. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And I'm wondering about instead of using UDA violation, can we say um, <clears throat> something about maybe it doesn't reach the um, something about standard of care rather than saying UDA violation? Yeah, there's a specific language I remember when I used to work for the Medical Board of California on a similar issue. We used to use a language called um, departure from standard of care. And um, I wonder if we could say like uh, a practice concern that, you know, um, that the medical commission feels is at risk of uh, a departure from uh, standard of care. I like that. Or, or I mean, I, I don't think the commission should be a feeling entity, but we could say that, um, you know, that the commission, um, uh, not even it, that the commission, um, what's the right word? That no. doesn't put like a feeling behind Identifies. it, right? It's like, Identify something like that, yeah. The, the departure from standard care can be a loss of things, and only certain departure 
a sanctionable. Right. I, that's I mean, why just like, a, that just like a, you know, someone didn't keep the records, uh, you know, uh, on time or didn't inform patient the uh, test results. Some of them not rise to, you know, we not we can't sanction. Like lots of time, and we say we wish we'd do something, but it can't. But it's still a departure to the standard care. But it's just not uh, uh, within the uh, scope that can be sanctioned. So, well, are you I saying you wasn't. don't like that language, or you or you do? I don't think we um, want to be too specific. I think we want to be general. Right. I agree. What I it's what I'm saying is still, still I, I, under, I totally get Hold it. On, Dr. Dr. Yu, Dr. Yu, I'm going to let you stop for just a second. Go ahead, Dr. Chung. No, I was just going to uh, I was just going to respond that if it were a true departure, because what I'm hearing Dr. Yu saying is that there's definitions of different departures of standard of care, and I would say that if if we identified a true departure from standard of care, that would lead to a stint. So. You know, I think we're just saying that there is a risk, which is what Mike was saying earlier. And I think to to uh, Dr. Lewis's point, leaving it just vague enough to be interpreted that way is probably the best way to um, to word it. Okay, um, I, I was just trying to uh, answer uh, Charlotte's question. Uh, the as a risk of a departure. Of standard care, I like that. Uh, this is very minor, but I would just make that departure from the standard of care rather than of the standard of care. But then, if I can, I ask Mike Farrell, what's your opinion about that verbiage? I, uh, I'm, I'm fine with that language. I'm not sure if I'm reading it correctly. Uh, do you want to put it in? Number one, I think that's where you want it, right? That first sentence of the whole yeah, rule. That, that's where I would put it. Because again, that I, that, well, that makes a demarcation between <clears throat> clinical support and something that should go right to a stid. Put it after identity. So I uh, address a practice concern identified as a risk of no no a there uh, no so that's not right either identified as a risk from the departure of standard of care identified in the course of investigation not identified sorry yeah i i would put in the course of an investigation after identified Yes, there you go. That's it. That's what it needs. Risk of departure from the standard of care. Oh, very good. I like it. What about everybody I, else? I like it. Is that good? Do we, do we need to put something down below? Do we do we decide that we don't want to put voluntary in here anywhere, or what did you? Uh... Well, so I think oh. uh, we we need to change number two just to be consistent with how we just modified number one. Okay. Deficiency. Yeah. To to to. Uh may take to change the practice to resolve the practice concern. That so we have practiced twice there, but. Yeah, and then you yeah, back to your question, Teresa, do we want to insert voluntary in there somewhere? Is a voluntary written and signed agreement? I think if you put it there, that that supports the um, 
that supports the question. So put it right before written after number two. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I agree. Just Amelia's trying to fix all, change all the deficiencies. No, yeah. <laughs> so, sorry. I know that you need to do that. You're right. Is a voluntary written and signed? Is that what you wanted yes. to say? Okay. Yeah, right, right in front of a written. So, so remind me, is was that a concern about the language and no volunteering in there? That, that was a concern from uh, WSMA that sparked the rest of this conversation. Okay. They wanted it to expressly reflect, reflect that it's a voluntary program. And I, I think we're all in agreement with that. Yep. Well, yeah, I would. I mean, in the past when we haven't been able to do anything, so I think that this gives us an option. Okay. But a stit or or any act action suspension, uh, no suspension, <laughs> stit or any others, those are not voluntarily, right? Well, they're still technically voluntary. All of this is voluntary. If you don't sign it, you get to go to hearing is the difference with the STID or yeah. an SOC, or you could lose your license. Right, I but this way, you don't go hearing anything. You just did not yeah. sign it. Yeah. Right. With with a STID, you know, as, as you know, if the respondent refuses to sign it, then we end up making the decision between either reluctantly closing a case or escalating it to a statement of charges. So I think we've dealt with their second concern by adding in this new voluntary yeah. language. And then they have this concern about the expansion of disciplinary authority. And there's consequences. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is uh, as non-disciplinary is we can get under uh, what the legislature allows us other than outright closing a case. I, I'm not sure I really understand this concern because if there's a concerns about patient safety, why not uh, proactively just welcome the uh, action being taken? Why why say this is a expanding a regulatory authority? <clears throat> I, 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 I don't see this as expanding anything from a disciplinary point of view. I I think they need to be a little, little bit more um agreeable. Or understand that, like, what we're trying to do is trying to help. And we're trying to prevent whatever the concern is from, you know, to use Alden's terms, going over the cliff and then getting into STID territory. And we try to protect the public and so, and also it's protecting them so that you won't, things will get, you know, uh, to the point that, that some disciplinary action has, has to be taken. So it benefit to both sides, I think. Okay. I, I do see there, so, so Jimmy, they, they have your point there about the term practice deficiency which we have now corrected. Mm -hmm. So I think we've dealt with that particular issue then. And then the last thing is the discrepancies between reported budget issues at WMC and the creation of a new program. Um, their concern here is that, you know, we raised fees and they feel like this is a new program that would cost money. 
Um, but Melanie, maybe you can speak to how much you think this might actually cost us to implement this. I don't, I would not be adding any new staff for this. This would be absorbed by the legal staff that we currently have. So I don't think that's a concern either. So I think we've dealt with this letter from Wisma. And so because we've changed um, one, we also need to look at four because it still talks about education, training, monitoring. How do we need to change that? Yeah, so, so I, I do want to say and to slightly disagree with you, Mike, on the term education. I, I think this is an educational venture, but the type of education is different than what we would put into the requirements for a STID or an order. Okay. So do we want to keep education? Remove the rest? So, uh, let, let me ask a question maybe in a different way. Do, do we need to even specify those things? What if we well, just we, said- we, we need to. So go ahead, Mike, please. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, can we just state the alleged practice concern may be corrected by practice changes? Or do we need to, uh, again, specify the types of practice changes? I, I like keeping it as general as, as possible. So in my mind, practice changes um, sort of encompasses all these different different things. How about education and practice changes? Because I'm assuming there is something you want to change. It's not just education. So you could say education and practice changes. I like that. I like keeping and are unlikely to reoccur. I think that's important. Sorry, Sorry Amelia. Yeah. <clears throat> well, one question, how do we know, uh, how do we know the education program, uh, uh, education is taken or practice change to have occurred? How do we know? Well, basically just on the honor system, well, that's another issue to discuss. Uh, there's going to be a, a protocol that goes with this that fills in these gaps um, that you're going to review and take a look at. Um, I, I do have a draft, uh, but you can have the compliance unit check on this with the help of investigations, check on this at the three month mark or the six month mark. Okay, so were they considered this as a monitoring? No, I monitoring in this context, at least with uh, the nursing commission and the chiropractic commission, is having an on having a person, the employer, or having somebody else act as a practice monitor. And I don't think we should do that um, because I think it's really important to distinguish between a STID and a clinical support plan. Other states are not going to be aware. So if, you, if you're going to do something that other states should know about, should not be using this, this rule. Okay. So, uh, Amelia, I just have one grammar thing here under 4 sub A. Uh, that should be and is unlikely to occur because about a practice concern singular. Okay, that's it.
we're going to be bringing this to policy tomorrow, so we can do some cleanup then as well. Okay. Well, you got so 13 minutes. Just, so. To be even more technical, do we need to say education and or? Practice we changes? can't say we can't say and or we can say or in rule but we can't do and slash or because this implies you have to do both but i don't know maybe maybe that's what we want i don't know what you're supposed to say it is uh education or practice changes or both i like that i like or both is it comma hmm. or both? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 think it is. I think it is. I I get into this all the time at work because I like commas and other people don't. <laughs> that looks nice, but it does. <laughs> Do we need to say or both here too? Education or practice changes? Yes. yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we should put the word either before that. Ooh. Well, no, you'd still have to say or both. I mean, either. Just... It's redundant. Oh, uh, with, with or both. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's clean enough as it is, I think. Mm -hmm. And you removed words again. Dr. Howe is so proud of you from across the country. <laughs> okay, so this is what we have through here. The physician agrees to participate and The commission has not authorized disciplinary action for the identified practice concern under all these RCWs. And then Mike has suggested this change to five to remove this sentence. Yeah, I did that at the suggestion of Heather Carter, uh, who's on the line. And maybe Heather, you want to explain why? But um, bottom line is we can't we can't do this. Yeah, I think um, my concern, and I can't see all of it, um, was you know. <laughs> You can't take away someone's um, or make them waive um, their rights to challenge a, this contract. I mean, it's basically going to be a contract between the commission and the physician. And um, it, even if you had this in the rule, it wouldn't be enforceable because someone can always claim, you know, challenge this at the superior court if they um, needed to. I'm also, I am concerned about how you're going to determine successful completion. Um, of the of the plan. I mean, that's something you're going to need to think think about um, how you determine that. And then what happens if they don't successfully complete it? I, um, so um, those are some things to, to think about. But I, I, this this waiver of any challenge or appeal is is wouldn't be enforceable. So accept that removal then. Anybody not want to accept that removal? Okay, move forward. I, I too, um, I, I think I expressed that before that I, I too have the concerns about uh, how do we know uh, the correction is such a satisfactory. Uh, but uh, based on Mike just said, that we would have compliant office maybe follow up with them and to see how they were doing and something is, is different from the state but they can still follow up with them right to check out the pro progress what they've done yes yeah, you bring up a, a really good point here um, that we should have mentioned at the beginning um, that the draft rule says when they complete it then the case is closed so, so timing is critical here. The case isn't closed when they sign it. The case is closed when they complete it. 
So that's a decision you have to make. Do you want the case closed when they sign it and then you follow up, or do you want it closed when they complete it? Mm. So what address Heather's completed? question? Should it be completed? Isn't that right? That's, that's what, what E right says. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right here, E. I, I think that's better. Completed. I, I to get so to Heather, your question, just, Heather. I I think that it's gonna. I imagine it's gonna be clear, and we need to be clear what actually needs to happen before it's completed. Um, I was thinking about this example of a case that I it was reviewing that's in investigations where an anesthesiologist like poked a kid like 25 times to get an IV. And someone said, oh, that might be a good case for clinical support once we get it. So the thing, we're, what we might recommend is maybe you need to get an ultrasound machine so that you, you can better visualize veins and so that you're not, you know, poking a kid 25 times to get an IV in. Like that's a discrete sort of thing that you're asking them to do. And then a discrete thing change that you're expecting, like, no longer poking kids 25 times or so I don't know something that we should be able to define discreetly what it is that we want to have happen where the com a commission a reviewing commissioner has any discretion to decide that that as as the example that dr. Lewis was given Yeah, no, I think so we can, I think it should be a process, right, of us coming up with what it is that we expect <laughs> to have happen um, through going through this, um, through clinical support. What we should define what the endpoint is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a case by case basis, just, you know, the same as when we decide what the specific stipulations are in a STID. If, if the case is remaining open, then we're gonna have uh, compliance or somebody determine that they've completed it. Probably a, it's gonna be a letter from the respondent's attorney with proof. Then the RCM can bring that back to case reviews and say, here's case number such and such. Respondent signed a clinical support plan. Here's proof that he's made the practice change. Uh, I recommend closure, and then you vote. That sounds like a, a reasonable approach procedure. And we can put this in great detail in the uh, procedure, which is going to accompany this rule. So how do you feel about the language that is in six then? Is there any changes we need to make? Sorry, I muted myself. Under subsection C, the commission shall evaluate whether the practice concern, oh, never mind. I didn't read it right the first time. Disregard. <clears throat> I think it's reasonable as is. It looks good. Um, Other comments? I have a, one question. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Dr. Yu. I have a question on the uh, uh, item D. The commission may conduct additional investigation and consider disciplinary action if additional facts become known. Would that face any legal challenge? If say I agree to do, you know, both sides agree to go through uh, resolve the issue 
uh, with a clinical support program and then commission start funding out something more, would that be uh, any, legal, any legal issues to do so? I, I think we have to have that caveat there because um, it's, it's within the realm of possibility we're going to find out something really bad is going on and it's no longer going to be something that clinical support is appropriate for. So I, I can see why people might have problems with that, you know, from like a WISMA or whatever, but I think we need that caveat there because I, I think we need to be able to escalate it to a different level if we find stuff going on that's not appropriate for clinical support. Yeah, I, I can. I I support to have that. I I would just I was just just curious whether there would be have some people would have bring up the legal challenges. They is a unilaterally uh, decision, you know, solely by the commissioner, commission. They could certainly make that make that argument, and probably will make that argument. But I think the idea is that this is an open case. We're offering to resolve it through a clinical support plan that in the process of completing the clinical support plan before the case is closed, the commission gets additional information that makes this case completely different, that the commission has the right to bring, do an additional investigation and bring a different type of action that they shouldn't be foreclosed from, you shouldn't be foreclosed from doing that. Okay. To, I, to protect the public and not just say, well, we have a clinical support plan, so there's nothing we can do. Okay, mm -hmm. that sounds good. This is Heather. I just have a um, concern about C, actually. Um, this kind of goes into my concern about how are you going to, determine if the conditions of the agreement are met. And this sort of makes the commission look at some subjective, I think you wanna keep the um, clinical support plan a very objective things they need to do because I think you, and you, you um, start adding subjectivity, then it's just gonna get really complex. And if you have to evaluate whether the concerns have been corrected, I mean, I just think, Mm, I, I don't know. I just think that's really getting subjective. And I think, um, you know, you're going to need to be very careful to have what is in the agreement um, very, you know, you do this education program and you um, buy the equipment necessary or something. And those are those are the kind of things I see as this being rather than, oh, yeah, I'm going to send someone in and they're going to evaluate whether or not you're now doing this procedure correctly. I think, um, yeah, I, I, that's just a concern, I guess. I, I think we're already, well, I do think we're already pretty good at being um, as objective as possible when we try to spell out what we'd like people to do, be to respond to you know, things like when we do STIDs and things like that, I'd, I'd like to think we're not terribly subjective there. So I think we can probably do it here too. Heather, what would you think if we took out number C and what's now number E, if we said, if the commission determines that the physician has successfully completed the clinical support plan, Yeah, I think that would be fine. And I would change the if to when. Can you repeat that, Dr. Small? Yes, when, the be, commission... when the commission determines that the physician has, has successfully. successfully completed. That better and, take and then C. take out C. Okay. Yeah. So how how will we know 
what, what are we going to measure to know that the physician has successfully completed the plan? Yeah. Well, it's going to be individualized, right? If there's going to be an individual like benchmark that has to be attained in order for us to close it. And like everything we do, it depends on the circumstances and it depends on the concern, right? Yeah, no, I agree with that. It's just that the more we do that, the more it starts to sound like more and more like a skid. Well, except it's except it's not reportable, and we consider as a commission that it is not yet at a point where we would do a stid. I guess my concern, and, I, and I, I'm supportive of this, of course, but trying to be a little bit of a devil's advocate. Uh, that if we hold a physician under some sort of kind of suspended animation where they are like conditionally under something to complete a plan, um, to me that sounds like action being taken during which that person is like under investigation. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to think like, um, or maybe just trying to learn, uh, you know, what, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Because it, I feel like if they, if, if they have done something enough that we want to monitor them to ensure that they have completed a plan, we should just do a STID. And just do proper monitoring. Right, and that, and that was a point that Mike um, Farrell made is that if that's what we, if that's what our goal is, this, this is not a clinical support case then. So yeah, so my, my suggestion, and I, I'm willing to be convinced otherwise, uh, my suggestion is that we, we don't, like this is just a one-way thing. Like we, we tell them there's a concern, Here's our, here are things that you should do that we think is going to help identify some of these or uh, address some of these concerns, but not then uh, necessarily monitor or follow up to make sure that they completed it. Because if we feel like we won't be, the commission will not be satisfied unless we know that they have completed the plan, to me, that is something that we should do as a STID. Well, not something necessarily. That something that shouldn't be reportable and all we're trying to do is raise a concern and ask them, this, these are things that maybe you ought to do. Um, should not be something that we feel like we have to follow up on. Well, to make sure that the correction uh, actions have been taken should be considered in a scope of a protecting the public and things right. not happen. But at the beginning, we changed the wording that it said uh, this apply, this program applies to uh, clinical concerns that uh, departure, risk of a departure from standard care. To me, that seems does not rise to even to the STID. Right, I think I'm, a, I'm, I think I'm kind of agreeing with you, uh, Yanling, by saying that if we feel that there's enough of a concern that in order to protect the public, we actually have to go back and check on them to make sure that they've done what we, you know, suggest that they do. We should put that into a STID, not a clinical support program. To me, a clinical support program is where, hey, these are, these are some of the things that we think we ought to do. They're not necessarily uh, something that we feel is a violation. Um, so, you know, we're not going to do anything, but here are some things that we think we need to do. And I think to do to get to that point, we we can't go back and check on them because if we're going to go back and check on them, we should just do a stid. 
Well, yeah, I, I, I disagree. I think what we currently are trying to do in this sort of kind of pseudo clinical support is our A3 closure, right? But we're, we're not satisfied with that approach, I, I don't think, as a commission. We're, we feel there's this area that we're not currently addressing where we don't really have, a, have any options to address things that don't yet rise to that point but are at risk for potentially getting there. And, and I don't see necessarily that following through to make sure that they accomplish it means that we should, we should have a stay. That doesn't seem like an automatic extension of this new program. Right. I, I, I think if we don't know whether they have follow through, then we don't even need this program in the first place. But we all know we need another tool that could address something that we cannot, uh, it does not rise to the level that we can take any disciplinary action. Yeah, no, so, I, I absolutely agree with what both of you are saying. I'm just saying where we draw that line needs to be below the point where we feel like we have to check up on them. If I feel like if we if we need to if we feel like we need to check up on them, that should be a STID, not a practice or a clinical support program. So if I can try to make a distinction here, so with most STIDs, the checking up we do is on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, I, I would see this as basically a one-time check to um, verify that they did what they agreed to do. You know, we're not gonna have them come in for personal appearances. We're not gonna do practice reviews. Uh, you know, granted some STIDs are shorter than that, but most STIDs, the monitoring that we do is recurrent or ongoing. So that's where I think the difference is. Yeah, I, I can see that point. Well, from the public safety uh, point of view, I think it's important that we we uh, uh, do follow up. I don't know what exactly the format going to be. Maybe the policy committee could have set up some guideline for the input from, from commissioners that we do follow up mm -hmm. on it in a non punitive way, in a you know maybe more collaborative way to help improve the, the practice because we want we don't want that happen because we we said that this is unlikely to happen again. <clears throat> so we don't make we want to make sure that so is there any more questions about the draft language then? I mean I, I understand the implementation questions and those types of things, but does anyone else have any um, further questions about what we have for draft language? Everything look good? Um, could I, may I ask for one more question? Um, yes. We taken out, <laughs> thank you. We taken out uh, the uh, item C. Um, would you say, you know, com commission were determined um, would that make it a clear to uh, any providers who signed up with this program that commission well evaluated? Would that somehow get a communicate uh, doing the uh, uh, communication? Because they, they don't get the impression that, yeah, sure, you sign, fine, and then you do whatever we, we think you, you ought to do. And, then that's it. Would that be a good or not good? <clears throat> well, so I, um, and this goes back to actually, I think what Jimmy <clears throat> was discussing a minute ago, I would personally not want to get into depth about the commission evaluating the, the compliance. So to use Charlotte's example, um, you know, of, of the anesthesiologist that stuck the child five times, and we say, you know, you should get an ultrasound machine. I mean, if that 
physician then comes back to us and says, I've got the ultrasound machine. You know, I think we can accept that. We don't have to send somebody over to the hospital to make sure that he actually did get the ultrasound machine. Yeah, so keep, I think, Yanling, at this point, keeping it vague, hmm. appropriately vague, hmm. is, is better. Yeah, I can see the point. So do you all approve this change that's on the screen then? If you approve, say aye. Aye. Or, aye. or raise your hand. <laughs> Looks like it's approved, Amelia. And then the last thing is this sentence here, number seven. Just make sure that's good too. Looks good to me. Me too. So we have no hands raised, no questions in the questions box. So if you want to close out the workshop, do I need no to talk about next steps? Uh, if anyone, do any of the panelists have any further questions or concerns? So do we actually have this approved after six years? <laughs> it has to go to policy tomorrow okay. as you've and written and today. And how, how many, I lost count of how many workshops we've had on this. <laughs> yes, I have two. <laughs> so All right, Amelia, next... go ahead so... and discuss the timeline and the next steps. Okay, oh, let yeah. me get that pulled okay. up. Hmm. So we'll bring the draft language to the policy committee tomorrow and then depending on what they decide, if they approve it to go to the 102 process, then it'll be brought to the full commission on Friday for approval of initiating that process. And then we'll draft the documents next month and get them sent over for review, and then we should have a hearing in October, which will be a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions or comments? Are we going to draft a letter to uh, respond in response to the, uh, uh, the medical association's uh, concerns? We don't typically do that. Um, if they raise the same concerns during the 102 process, then we will respond to all of their concerns as part of the rules package for the CR 103, which is making the rules final. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? If no one else wishes to speak, I will close the workshop. Thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Teresa. You're welcome. Thank you. See y'all tomorrow. You. Thanks, everybody. Tomorrow. Thank you, Bye. Teresa. Good job. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Yep, that was great, Teresa. Bye. <laughs>